that he was vastly knowledgeable about everything going on in the theatre, that he was a marvellously droll raconteur, and that, above all, he was extraordinarily modest and self-aware. Theatre acting is sculpting in snow. Performances survive only in the memory. You have to have been there to have seen them. So when we talk of a great theatre actor, we can't demonstrate that greatness. You just have to take the word of those who saw them. John Gielgud was a great theatre actor. In fact, the greatest English classical actor of the last century. It's inconceivable that we'll see his like again. The theatre has changed. The spirit of the age has changed. So if we're mourning the death of a great actor, we're also mourning the passing of an age that encouraged greatness in the theatre. On the occasion of his 90th birthday, six years ago, Omnibus made a film about John Gielgud. As you can see in this revised version, he was still, as he was until his death, forever young. I have frequently envied painters, writers, even critics. I've thought how happy they must be to do their work in private, at home, unkempt and unobserved, able to destroy or renew or improve their creations at will and judge them objectively in their unfinished state, to watch their gradual development and to admire their past achievements ranged in their bookshelves or hung upon their walls. I've often wished I were able to rise in the middle of the night, switch on the light, and examine some previous performance of mine calmly and dispassionately as I looked at it standing on the mantelpiece. Sir John Gielgud was born on the 14th of April, 1904, and his nine decades on and around the stage amount to a virtual history of the theatre life of this century. Tonight's omnibus puts together some performance highlights and archive interviews from that long career. As someone who's been lucky enough to have worked with Sir John quite a bit, and particularly in Shakespeare, you do inevitably feel that you're sharing the stage with some kind of living legend. But if he's a monument, he's a monument who's still working, still developing, and still surprising us. For example, it's not long since he seemed to be setting the keystone on his approach to Shakespearean verse speaking with Prospero's books. And by the spurs, plucked up the pine and cedar. But it also turned out that he was taking his clothes off and taking part in an extraordinary state-of-the-art electronic pageant. He stopped that. Hobson, how good to see you. He's probably best known now for his quintessential English screen performances, like his butler in Arthur. I brought you orange juice, coffee, and aspirins, or do you need to throw up? People were astonished to hear Sir John talk dirty with Dudley Moore, but it didn't stop him getting an Oscar. Perhaps you'd like me to come in there and wash your dick for you, you little shit. The, the first day I went off to work with them, I was putting on my underwear and thinking, today I'm going to go and direct Sir John Gielgud, and it was, it was a horrible, horrible feeling. What's that you've got there? Good heavens, you haven't acquired a sudden taste of this sort of stuff, have you? It was in the 30s that he was first hailed as the greatest actor of his generation, when he was refining his definitive speaking of Shakespeare. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable. I had to have taken you up myself. But he was also finding time to act for Alfred Hitchcock. That would have been awful nice. What a pity. And had some success as a song and dance man. Won't you learn to love me? Then we'll have Above all, he's been seen as the inheritor of an acting tradition, a feeling which, by all accounts, was already there in his notable Mark Antony in the Hillside Preparatory School, Julius Caesar. Is it fair to say that your attitude to the theatre and your persona as an actor has always been a romantic one? I suppose it is true that. I always was 
uh, used it as an escape, I think. I'm a terrible escapist in life. And uh, to go to a theater and shut myself up in a dressing room and come out as somebody else and live a, a mimic life does give me pleasure and I suppose always has done. He was brought up in Kensington in well-to-do circumstances. His father had a Polish background with a famous actress in the family and his mother's relations were the Terrys, a formidable theatre dynasty of whom the most celebrated, Ellen Terry, had been the partner of Henry Irving. Gilgood's uncle, Fred Terry, toured the country with his wife in barnstorming hits like The Scarlet Pimpernel and Sweet Nell of Old Drury. The whole family were famous for the quality of their voices. Fred Terry was a very jolly, rubicund man who laughed very loud and had a beautiful voice which he could use with great skill. He could drop it an octave when he felt inclined to get the house absolutely magically quiet. But uh, Ellen, on the other hand, was, uh, seemed to be very free with her voice. And although it was, a, it, you never, it, it was a very athletic voice, and I think that the athletic power of the voice is probably what was so valuable in all those actors. They all had beautiful diction, and they all phrased very well, uh, instinctively. Ellen seemed to know exactly in Shakespeare where the emphasis should come, and she flung the line out with such spontaneity that you really thought she'd invented it herself. It was quite extraordinary. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that gave. His mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. Gilgood was persuaded to go to stage school to develop some technique, and after a spell at Rada, he had several walk-on parts and appeared as a butterfly in Nigel Playfair's production of The Insect Play. He was still not yet 20 when he landed his first Romeo. Mr. John Gilgood has a good voice, a pleasant face, and useful figure. He comes, they tell me, of a great theatrical family, so he should be useful in the theatre in time. Mr. Gilgood's body from the hips down never meant anything throughout the evening. He has the most meaningless legs imaginable. Looking back, is it possible for you to decide why you made such a mess of that earlier? Well, I had the most terrible clothes to begin with, and the most wicked wig, because I was only 19, and I suppose I can't have been so hideous as all that. <laughs> but. Um, I didn't know how to move. I think I spoke not badly, but we had a very, very uh, drastic director. I just wasn't ready, and I didn't know how to uh, select what I wanted to do or really put over emotion. I just enjoyed, indulged in my own emotions and imagined that was acting, and I only learnt long afterwards that you can't indulge, although you may indulge your emotions in imagining a part, you mustn't allow them free reign until you have selected exactly what you want to show the audience and how much you must show it while you're doing it. I've been cherishing through the perishing winter nights and days the Sunday But a more convulsive presence was already on the scene in the 20s. In the wake of the First World War, Noel Coward embodied a new kind of brittle, clever young man. Gilgood himself had other talents to amuse. I used to draw pictures and take them down and play the piano by ear a bit. And I was a bit of a show-off. <laughs> and then I met Noel Card at a party and thought he was a terrible show-off. <laughs> and he was before he was a success. And sure enough, and it was very ironic because then he became an enormous success in the 20s and the first real chances I had were to follow him and understudy him in two plays and take over his parts. And by that time he'd become a skilled and brilliant actor and I was still a great show-off. You weren't very enamoured of Mr. Cow the first time you met him, were you? Not that time, no. He was with a, a girl called Betty Chester, who he was acting with, who was in the co-optimists afterwards. And he came into some tea party or cocktail party and rushed to the piano and performed. And I thought he was awfully conceited. Probably because he was taking the limelight away from what I thought I ought to have <laughs> at that early age. But after that, we became great friends, and I learned an awful lot from him. Gilgood understudied and then took over the Noel Coward role in his scandalous play, The Vortex getting the job because he played the piano. He again followed Coward in the hit play The Constant Nymph, which ushered in some successes as a smart West End juvenile lead. 
in 1929, he took the calculated gamble of going south of the Thames to the Old Vic, then run like an eccentric temperance house by Lillian Bayliss, with the mission of bringing Shakespeare to ordinary people. What would he do? Had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have, he would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy metal rascal, peak like John Advin, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing. Did you have any conscious model for when you were studying the part the first time? No, I didn't. I, I thought I had. I thought I would copy all the actors I'd ever seen in turn. And I'd but by then seen about a dozen or fifteen Hamlets. And of course Irving was my god, although I'd never seen him. I just read about him being Ellen Terry's partner and the whole idea of this magnetic, strange man who I knew I could never be anything like somehow appealed to me more than any other past actor that I'd ever read about. But I didn't try to copy, I only sort of took note of all the things he'd done and looked at the pictures of him and so on. But when it came to the Vic, the play moved so fast and there was so much of it that I suddenly felt, well, I've just got to be myself. And I really played absolutely straight as far as I could. It was a kind of revelation to me, the way he was playing it, the discipline of it, the music of it and creating a kind of world out of nothing, which was exactly what I wanted at that time. I'd never until then heard words spoken quite in that way. He'd found a new way of speaking Shakespeare. What must the king do now? The biggest success of the 1929 Old Vic season was Richard II, a character whose highly strung temperament was the perfect foil for the young John Gielgud. Must he lose the name of king? Oh, God's name, let it go. Many people seem to think that when you first played Richard II, that this interpretation was the spearhead of a new kind of acting. Do you think there was any truth in that? No, I think it was more the result of an old kind of acting. In what, what I've way? heard now. Well, I think that I did inherit from Terry's and from the, uh, what I call the Panache actors that I admired so much in my youth, a certain gift of projection and uh, uh, unreal kind of uh, romantic acting, which I did with so much conviction for myself that I did manage to convince the audience. But now, hearing it again, it sounds to me very voice conscious. That's the tune that that Tarvin woman, that put it of prunes into other people's mouths, tried to make out with the... Straight after the Vic season, yeah. Gielgud landed the juvenile lead in J.B. Priestley's The Good Companions. Oh, drunk and rowdy, turning the schoolroom into a tap room. It was his first really big commercial success, but a part he never really cared for. Steady, steady, steady. We'll leave in the morning. Oh, if I leave in the morning, I must have a term salary, 52 pounds. A mere pittance, ladies and gentlemen, but mine own. Absolutely. More to his taste was a popularized historical entertainment based on Richard II, which was soon to be seen packing in audiences at the new theater, now the Albury. You couldn't get a seat. Uh, I managed to get a seat because I think I came to see him here when I, I was about, what, 19 or something like that. Um, I don't know if it was 13 or 14 times up in the, in the gallery. To take an army into France like his father and his grandfather before him. Oh, and war, 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 it's all you ever think of. You won't try to understand. It's like battering one's head against a brick wall. Just because you I rather... will not stay to listen to you. Oh. Hysteria. I mean, he came onto the stage with simplicity and a certain sort of beauty and, of course, that fabulous voice, which, you know, was like a silver trumpet round the place and this beautiful diction that he had. I can remember the play being incredibly beautiful, sort of white and gold, and Gwen Frank on Davis was his queen, and he was this extraordinarily handsome young man. I became his great fan, and I wrote up for his, uh, his photograph, and he sent me a portrait which I pinned on my wall again with Annabella and Greta Garbo.